Whoa, look at that. Hey, man, oh, just whoa, in just time. Just, <laughs> just in time. Just in time. Just in time. <sighs> Welcome. This is the Just in Time song. And this is uh, Lounge Singer 101. <laughs> Star That'd Wars. Yeah. That'd be fun. And that Justin like Tyler probably, would be a great stage name. That is probably my favorite lounge song. It, 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 I would believe so, being who you are. Those who don't know. <laughs> it's a Saturday Night Live skit. Bill Murray, I think. Or was it Chevy Chase? I think it was Bill Murray. No, Bill Murray. Bill Murray. Star Wars, we're talking mm -hmm. about Star <laughs> yeah. Wars. Yeah, that's exactly. a good one. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to welcome you to our show. Uh, looks like we got a few of our regulars in here. Thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, it has been a while since we've done this show. Um, it's called What is Doug Reading? In fact, I didn't even show the right opening. Let me show it. What's Doug reading? <laughs> yeah, see, that's what threw me off. That's why I was still running across the room because I was expecting that. Oh. Intro, like, totally screwing my my thing, man. Mm -hmm. So, uh, welcome to Cindy and Cartola and Dirk and everybody. Uh, in fact, we'll read what they're saying there, Doug, so we can reply to it uh, while I talk about who's joining us. Anonymous yeah. Rex, Unidentified Celebrity Review, uh, Shawnee. Thank you all for being here. In fact, I did an episode of the Unidentified Celebrity Review with the host, Louise. Uh, so go to his YouTube and check that out. Uh, also, thank you for being a member there, Louise. Uh, and he wants to have you on the show. You should be on the show. Oh, yeah. Email me, douglas at phoenixshaving.com, Louise. And he's really excited uh, because he got Elizondo. So he's going to have Luis Elizondo, who wow. the guy who ran the Pentagon UFO program. So uh, he's thrilled because he got an interview with him. And uh, uh, so that's really cool. So, uh, yeah. So Luis says he sent it along. But, yeah, check that out. Otherwise, I interviewed Ben Hansen on Den of Geek lately. Uh, I interviewed Tony Harris from The Proof is Out There. And I'm going to be part of Alien Con. I'm going to be hosting a panel nice. for that TV show, The Proof is Out There. I'll put a, a link in here. It's free. Um, of course, Alien Con is how Doug and I met because I was actually, I wasn't officially a speaker at the first one where we met, but some of my friends came to me and said, Will you join us on this panel? So I ended up hosting a panel and being part of another panel while we were there. And then the next couple of events or next few events, they did formally ask me to speak. So I did do talks and luckily I've hit it off with the history people and they want me to um, do this panel that we'll be doing later today. I'm going to have to put makeup because I've got some zits from the masks. The, I'm wearing masks. You didn't they, even have to say anything. No one notices this. That's called spotlight syndrome. I know, but these are, Oh really? There's a word for it. There is a name for it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, these, these are our peeps. So I want to be honest and open and, you know, have transparency with these guys. So dude, if you were going to be transparent, we would see through you. <laughs> but let's I'm be clear. Fine. No, really. Let's be clear. <laughs> cute. Very cute. Uh, your jokes are so opaque. Um, they, why don't you share? What have you been up to? Cause this is, it's been like a month, uh, or so yeah. since we've done one of these. I was. I actually joined People you are last. Talking about week. your hair, what the heck? Oh my god! Yeah, I haven't been to the barber shop since um, since forever. But I haven't had a haircut since March. It's my COVID hair. You know how they do the hockey beards and whatnot. I, I yeah. guess they do. But I'm told, anyways. I don't follow this, but I figured I'd do a COVID a thing. So it's like my challenge. I actually challenge you guys to do it as well. However, this is probably late in my challenge, but I've been growing my hair out since March and the beard kind of, I, I take that down here and there. Otherwise it gets weird. But um, yeah, this is my, my COVID look. And I really, you know, I want to be able to look back at pictures and whatnot and see like the COVID year maybe. Um, so that's what's going on there. However, yeah, I did join um, you last week for, the open minds. Yeah. 
You were my so, special guest for the Open Minds podcast, which was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Was, for that doing was that. it. Was a lot of fun. That was probably one of my favorite ones so far. I don't think I got much in, but uh, it was definitely one of my favorite ones so far. Most interesting, I think, for me, anyways, um, as a participant. But it has been a while um, because, and I explained this last week. I've just been so focused on politics right now. Uh, I. I was so like, it's such an uncomfortable space. I couldn't do anything else, but like constantly read the news. I would wrap myself in the news, like a blanket. Like that was some form of protection. Maybe just the knowledge of what could possibly be going on at any given moment. I'm not sure what it was. I'm not typically like that. I'm, in fact, I'm never like that, but it really shook me at my core. Um, which is just weird. It's the older you get, the the strangest anxieties seem to rear their heads that you never had before. And, uh, so it kind of made me want to put everything on hold, and that, including reading, which is typically I wouldn't say it's an escape for me, but in, because if it was, I'd be I'd have my nose in the book. But it just shook everything up, so I kind of couldn't focus on getting my as much reading in as I'd like to. So I didn't think I would be ever able to offer anything of value for shows. In fact, that said, I've come to a conclusion that I want to do these shows uh, once a month rather than once a week, just because I feel so rushed sometimes. Um, so I hope that's cool with everybody, but unless maybe we'll alternate, I don't know, but at this point, so yeah, that's what I've been up to. And aside from that work and work's been off the hook, it seems like, you know, in these times of uncertainty, people just want to go online and shop. So we've been nonstop busy at phoenixshaving.com. So I can't complain in that regard. However, it's been a, a hell of a, hell of a ride since November, eh? Yeah, and I can't blame you. I've been similar. Uh, it was certainly part of why I wasn't getting online as quickly. Um, I know our good, my good friend Bryce Zabel, uh, that some of you probably know, uh, that follow Open Minds because we've had him on quite a bit. He's been a guest writer at times and stuff like that. He and he's a filmmaker, uh, Hollywood guy, and he was the same way. He said, "Until this is resolved, I'm not doing UFOs." And so yeah. he's been totally, um, because this has been a big deal. And of course, we don't want to get into politics. We'll move on. But no, but uh, he's right. People, it, mm -hmm. It's like a luxury to be able to talk about this the things we talk yeah. about. Where it's a privilege. And when there's just so much, so many unknowns out there, you, you're just destabilized, and you can't give it your yeah. all. So I, I, I think it's unfair to you, the viewers, for us to get up here and just fake it and you know when we're our minds somewhere else so i think yeah you know, exactly and, and and maybe and not everybody felt this way and i totally get that and that's fine if you didn't but at least for some of us um i think you and i and bryce and martin even felt this way we felt that our country was facing an existential threat um and we were afraid of of, of violence uh and you know being in Arizona, especially you and I, you know, um, Alex Jones was here kind of trying to incite, you know, people uh, for a period of time. So it was really, really scary. Uh, and so uh, it, it was difficult to watch and difficult to go through. And um, I know there's people who see things differently, had a different experience, but um, just, uh, yeah, it was uh, stressful and very trying. That's for sure. It really was. It really was. But before we oh, get yeah. ourselves all freaked out again, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. On to what we're looking at here. So uh, thank you all so much again for joining. Did you see any comments here? Lots of people talking about the beard and um, always people are very interested in your facial and, and other hair and, and it, the state of your hair. Um, so yeah, lots of comments along those, those lines. It's chaotic, folks. Um, it's chaotic at this point. <laughs> I Although like no Mary. She says, watch the Weather Channel. It's much more peaceful. You know what I like to watch, honestly, is like uh, impromptu, like travel videos on YouTube, like the Camino de Santiago. You can get people like doing their own. You know, they're filming it as they're going, like stuff like that. Those YouTube travel where they just they don't talk much, but it's just them with the camera. There's also a guy who does long boats. I think on on the Travel Channel. Have you seen that? The long boats. He goes down all the different like. Um, oh. Yeah, I, I I haven't seen that. I would love I, I would like that, but I what it reminds me of um is Europe, I guess this is beginning getting big. Well, they'll just show like a lake or they'll show a field with some animals 
and yeah. stuff. And people will watch that all day. Yeah. And I, I get it. I, I used to do that on Sundays with golf. I'd put golf on because it looks so pretty. They're in these pretty places. It's really mellow. Door. <laughs> people are pretty chilled out. Yeah, we're here in Arizona happening out here. Yeah. So I used to do that with golf. It is. But I had a friend who would have do that with the Weather Channel. He would have that on because it was so calming. Uh, so I get it. The Weather Channel was a good place for you just for me back in the day in the nineties at least to discover new music. Like they would play the coolest music at one time. <laughs> oh, I don't really? think they still do. Yes, I, wasn't so I was aware like, of that. I, I I don't know. That that's 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 my story, and I'm sticking to it. Oh, um, one last thing before we get to the book, the the topic of the day. I did want to say, and my hat reminded me because I got this in <laughs> Hungary on the set of Mars, the TV show for uh, National Geographic. Great show. If you haven't seen it, you can still get it streaming two seasons. And it was half television show, half documentary where they would have like Elon Musk and they would ask him about going to Mars. And then they would have a fictional part where they show these people going to Mars, you know, using technologies and ideas that we might have in the future. Um, oh, thank you to Anonymous Whoa. Rex for so much synchronicity going on here right now. Out. You have no idea. Um, oh, really? So you'll have to tell me about it. But I was able to participate. There's a new show coming out called Resident Alien. In fact, I think it start, started this week. I haven't seen it yet. It's on the Sci-Fi channel. And Sci-Fi invited me to this trivia game about aliens. It was mostly Sci-Fi questions with the cast of the show. So it was me and a bunch of other journalists. And it was a lot of fun. They didn't even film it or anything. I thought that they were going to film it. But no, it's just for us to have fun with the cast. But one of the guys on the show was one of the guys I got to meet in Hungary. He was one of the actors on Mars. Right. So that was right. really cool to see him there. And that reminded me. And I wanted to plug the show because I very was appreciative. I mean, that sci-fi would have me there. That was really cool of them. That is cool. In fact, uh, they sent us like a mug and some other stuff. But uh, it was really cool. So check out Resident Alien. They did show us some clips. And it looks really, really funny. But okay. I guess we should right as you were about to talk about Right when you were talking about the oh, Mars yeah, hat, Stacy chimes in. Stacy says hi. You know, she likes the curls and whatnot. I get it. I totally get it. Um, but <laughs> I commented on Stacy's post this morning. She on MUFON, I'm pretty sure it was her post. Um, it was like an astronaut playing guitar on a planet somewhere. And I I posted the T-Rex song Bar, uh, Ballrooms of Mars. And as soon as I was thinking about that, you start talking about Mars, and then you get a a, a chat, a super chat. From anonymous Rex, as I was thinking about T Rex, it was like all this happening at the same time. Mind blown. I mean, that was real. That really happened. Anyways, folks, so let's get to it. <laughs> Today's book, I've been, I, I'm absolutely in love with. I highly recommend it. I can't get enough of it. But it's Bullfinch's mythology. Bullfinch. That book is full Bull. of Bullfinch. <laughs> it is actually. It is. Um, this is like. This was the go-to collection of Greek myths from back in the day. It was used um, in school for at least 100 years after the fact. Um, it was one of the best translations of Greek and introductions for most folks who didn't know uh, Greek and, and Roman myths, as well as world myths, too. This actually is a collection of three of his books. It's The Age of Fable, which is mythology. It's The Age of Chivalry, which is the Arthurian leather, legend. And then The Legends of Charlemagne. So you got like the Greek, Roman, British, French, and then it even delves into some Egyptian. I think he's got one story, one Egyptian tale in here, and some Norse. I think one Norse as well. So it's a collection of all these in one like in one place, and it's just absolutely brilliant. Bull, Bull Finch, and you know, and it also ties in with recent events too, because Bull Finch, uh, Thomas Bull Finch, was born uh, in the in 1798, I believe. I could be wrong with that. Um, I shouldn't be wrong with that, but I think I am wrong with it. Thank you to Unidentified but Celebrity Review. By the way, he gave me this this tip. When someone gives me a, a tip or joins the site, uh, I should make sure and call that out and thank them. And thank you, Louise, for that, because you're right. I should be doing that. So thank you. <laughs> Anyways, he was born in uh, 1790s. To uh, well, his father. Well, actually, you know what? I got it right at the beginning of the book. What's great about this book, which I should point out first of all, is it's leather bound. So if you're into collecting books, this is something you might want on your shelf. It's beautiful with like the gold leaf embossed. It is. It really is. It's got the a cloth bookmark. 
Is that Medusa on the front? That is, yes, that's Medusa or one of the Gorgons. Actually, that could be. By the way, Mary says, uh, my husband and I say this to each other because synchronicities happen to us all the time. Uh, what are the odds? Pretty good. Uh, funny. Yeah, we have we've had synchronicities and we think that Stacy's involved. Somehow she <laughs> is a always conduit. Yeah, um, yeah she's syn synchronic, syn synchronic conduit. Uh, Cartola but, sent me some Canadian money. Thank you, Cartola. Oh, uh, that's not real. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But yes, yeah, so you can see it's a really quality book. You get the gold on the side as well. I mean, it's really it's just a nice quality leather bound book. It's it's by uh, Canterbury Classics, oh. and I think it cost me like twenty five dollars. So if you're trying to put together a really handsome looking library, mm. Canterbury Classics is one of them. And you know what? Who else does a pretty good job? Is Barnes Nobles? They do leather bound books too, um, mm. and they're pretty. They're very similar in that in this way. But yes, so great book, and right from the get go. It starts off with a modern introduction. And so that's where I'm gonna get his birthday from. But Thomas, okay, so yeah, Thomas Bullfinch was born July 15th in 1796 in Newton, Massachusetts. July so we got 15th? Huh? July 15th? July. Yeah. My birthday, July 17th. Oh my God, kinda. Um, <laughs> and his, so his father was an, an architect, uh, Charles Bullfinch, who worked on the US Capitol. Hmm. Yes. So I thought I'd you know bring every, everything up to to date. Yeah. Here. So I, I found what you're doing. Yeah. Right. You pick up. You're picking up what I'm putting down. Um. But yes. So it's really interesting because he, this book, the well, again, he wrote these in three different parts. It was put together uh, posthumously after he died, obviously, um, in as into one volume. But the reason why he compiled this and translated it is because he felt like most people back then, and even to this day, aren't getting the allusions or, or references in modern poetry or in movies or in even polite conversation when it comes to classics or classical uh, classical literature. Uh, a lot of stuff is going over people's heads. So with that in mind, he put this book together. And he went to um, – well, he went. He graduated from Harvard, but he also went to Latin school as well in uh, in Massachusetts, and uh, graduated with honors. So he was just fluent in Latin, which is good. It's kind of bad too because all of his translations come out of the Latin, which comes out of the Roman myths. So he doesn't go as far back as the Greek. So some stuff he gets a little off that we now know is off. But back then, again, this was the book they were using um, because it was the closest thing to the originals. Um, but a lot. Of, I mean, I'm just it's. So well done and just such a great compilation. It really is like a Bible to a certain extent. Um, and, and yes, first one quick update. Uh, this is important because Cartola says his birthday is July 9. That's my mom's birthday. <laughs> Cartola, are you my mom? Um, <laughs> so, um, but that but book, from what I understand, because I, I know a little bit about it, but uh. Didn't it popularize the Greek mythologies? Uh, because from I, from what I thought, it wasn't really being taught in the schools until then, which is interesting because yes, nowadays right. those myth Greek mythologies are such a huge part of our lives. You know, um, in one way, shape, or form. And, I mean, names yeah, of cars, everything. comic book mm -hmm. uh, storylines. It was because if you wanted to know Greek mythology back then, or be familiar with the myths, or familiarize yourself with it, you had to know Latin. You had to know Greek. You had to go from the source because there were no books like this around. It's only after this that you see them popping up. You know, for over the next two hundred years, even Robert Gray's, uh, the poet, did his. Greek gods and, and heroes, and people love this version. I actually prefer Bullfinch's over Robert Gray's. Robert Gray's, he gets a lot of stuff wrong as well, and his is just more dreamier. Granted, all the myths seem to like bleed into each other, and they have this dreamy kind of element to them. Um, you also get different versions, which typically had to do with like different parts of the empire, the Roman Empire. Uh, cultures being conquered, where some gods were not yeah. uno, and then a conquering army comes in and they, not only do they lose their land and their way of life, if they lose their way of life, but they lose their gods being number one and the new gods are uh, instated. Um, and I have a couple other 
this is uh you know, a lot of religion has been across the 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 globe really is more philosophical where the leaders kind of choose the the worldview of the their serfdom um type of thing and yeah. So, yeah like you said you know zeus is king well no we're not zeusians we're athenians yeah. and, so. yes well like the titans and whatnot i mean and, and really you know another interesting thing too is when you read this um it's just so much we've discovered so much more since this book was written so it's interesting like where you're reading this as like as fact and you know that's not really true like cronus for example um he kind of gets that wrong where he compares cronus zeus's dad who was eating him um you know, and Saturn, Saturn or Cronus was the god during the golden period of human humankind, where everything was great and wonderful. Yet he's this monster eating people, and the way that Bullfinch describes it is like it's more of an al uh, allegory in that regard. Where mm. since he is father time, anything with a beginning time eats eats away. Ah. But he's wrong. He was uh, because he's, he wasn't familiar with the Greek. He's only familiar with the Rome, uh, the Latin. So Cronus, he's talking about Cronus, Saturn with Cronus, K R O N O S, not Cronus, C H R O N O S. So he confused the two, and mm. they weren't the same gods. Uh, Father Time and Saturn are two different gods. So this god was actually eating his youth, and that could also show that there was some other group of people taking over the old the old lands and building up their gods in place of the old ones being the titans with new gods uh like zeus and so on and so forth so mm -hmm. i found that interesting i also found you know a lot of things you know that we forget uh that occurred in the, in the greek myths or that we seem to get wrong in pop culture like a pandora's box for one pandora mm. didn't have a box it was a jar <laughs> but we always say pandora's box huh. um and then, like the story of Romeo and Juliet, for those not familiar with the classics, uh, will will not, not know this, but it really comes out of Pyramus and uh, Thisbe. This, it's the same exact story, which makes you wonder. Like Shakespeare, Shakespeare had to have a classical education. Uh, the whole, you know, confusion of our identity. Who was Shakespeare is always in the back of my mind too when I'm reading some of these things, um, mm. because. It, I don't believe in the man named Shakespeare. I believe in someone else writing under the pen name Shakespeare. Really? Uh, oh, you have a oh, Shakespearean yeah. conspiracy, conspiracy theory. A Shakespeareacy. A <laughs> Shakespeareacy. Yeah, I, I really. Oh. I think it might we'll have, have to talk more about that in a little bit. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll do that on a, on a maybe on another episode. Um, another thing I've noticed too. This is like um, always whenever I'm reading um, older. Uh, Ancient texts, by the way, ancient texts are really accessible. A lot of people think that they're diff they or have it in their mind, anyways, that they're difficult to read and hard to get into. But if you read the prose, a lot of them um, have been translated into prose as well. Super easy to read, super accessible, more so than a lot of other classic books like uh, Chaucer and whatnot. Like Middle English, Old English is, can be difficult and really wordy. But uh, modern translations of uh, ancient texts really easy to read. Um, but that said, so while I'm reading this, I, I, I always try to pay attention to what's going on culturally in the text. And one thing I definitely noticed is the limited amount of colors that they were using back then to describe things. And so I did a little research around that after the fact. Um, and blue was not used or no, uh, known to the ancient world, at least in Greece anyways, with Homer and whatnot. Um, there was no word for blue. There was no word for orange either. They were all just spoken around. Really? Yes. Yes. So when you when we say it was a kind of a black and white world in certain writings, it almost was a black and white world to a certain extent because they didn't recognize certain colors. Whether they saw them in, or not is up for argument, but they didn't recognize them literally in, in literature. Um, literally in literature, I just said. Um, but So I found that interesting and uh, just started digging into cu culture and color. I don't know why. I don't want to go off on a tangent with that. But I thought it was interesting how like one culture can see like can distinguish different colors down to the you know the the the, the finest point, and others just talk around certain colors like they, like if it's yellow, green, blue, it's all the same. 
<laughs> but then you know, then it makes you think of like um, the Eskimos with their you know what is it, fifteen words for color uh, for snow. Well, what colors did they did they use? Yellow, green, um, yellow and green yellow, makes blue. Red, red is one of the most popular colors back then. Blue, they didn't really, they didn't see a lot of blue back then. Is what it all comes down to. The only things that were blue really was the sky. So you wouldn't talk about it as blue. You would talk about that as heaven. Sky's pretty big. Yes, I mean, and just this sky colored. Sky colored, yeah. You could maybe you could use this sky colors, but um, but they didn't like blue dyes. Just didn't exist back then. So I mean, they, you you weren't exposed to that. So you would you needed words to talk about what was around you in your everyday environment. Like red, red was everywhere, um, and red was also a really cheap dye too. So red had its own color. You know, wherever like these things were, they had names for it. But if they were, if it wasn't in their everyday life, again, they weren't used and they weren't needed frankly. So yeah, I thought that was just interesting. Yeah, I think orange was the last color uh, we came to name in our time. Um, another interesting fact is all the colors we tended to recognize at the same time around the world, which is, again, goes back to that whole collective consciousness um, concept, I think. Maybe, or but trade. Trade. That's true. That's true. So um, a couple of things. First of all, let me see. There were some comments. People love the Shakespeare. In fact, someone already made a hashtag Shakespeare. Cartola. Thank you. <laughs> Genius. Um, Anonymous Rex. Finally, he keeps asking us to talk about aliens, but uh, he's, he likes the bacon Shakespeare. He agrees with that. So um, and. and uh, let's see. That's about other everything people are saying. Mary had something to say. I remember she said something funny. Um. Anyway, uh, Dirk, she, she, of course, she, she, has. Just... I was. Yeah, we're talking about Greek right and Romans. Yeah. So there you go. Um. What I find interesting is that this book popularized the Greek and Roman mythologies, but the other mythologies it talks about, Charlemagne and the Arthurian, uh, they're part of the same book. I mean, I but I'm not aware that those were taught in school, at least um, not here in the States. Uh, do you know it's, in, it's interesting that the – Shakespearean or the, the Greek and Roman mythologies, I guess it makes sense. They're bigger civilizations. They were essentially the religions um, that based Western society. Um, and I guess I don't think they knew much back then about like the Sumerians, where all of that comes from. Um, but uh, yeah, the Arthurian, I guess even when it comes to the Arthurian philosophy or mythologies and Charlemagne, they're not that big, at least historically. I don't know about now, even now they're not that big. So I don't know that there's as many people that talk about them, but it's interesting that this book was so influential on the Roman and Greek that, you know, the other mythologies didn't become more popular as well. Well, I, again, his, this, these were all written in his attempt to familiarize people with these references and allusions in pop culture of the day you know so people because people were just skimming over these things they weren't getting them or it it's kind of like looking at you know going to a museum before you take an art history class versus after you take the art history class it gives you more of an appreciation for what you're reading or what you're looking at and so that's where this book is a huge win um when it, when it comes to teaching the classics and super accessible accessible um i'm trying to think what else other highlights of this book. I see. I haven't gotten into uh, the Norse stuff in here yet, or where is it? Yeah, the Norse stuff. The Nibelungalid. Nibel Nibelungalid. I gotta read that. Um, or the Nordic epic, or the Nordic epic of Volsung. So I'm looking forward to Volsung. that. And yes, so they have the Egypt. They have one. He has one Egyptian mythology in here too. Uh, it's the tale of Isis and Osiris, and that's only because when this was written, that that's all they had at their at at hand. Uh, so it's just a wonderful, wonderful collection that I'm really looking forward to digging into over the next month, um, and just so, so well rounded. 
would like to say uh, that he thinks that, you know, what you were saying about colors is why nothing rhymes with orange. <laughs> I think Turkey's being funny, but that's a good one. I like it. You know, it's funny because uh, the name orange, com it was named after the fruit. Most people what think people it's had the first blue eyes. That's a good question. I would guess, I think blue eyes come from Danes, the Norse, if I remember correctly. And of course, they're the ones who conquered most of Europe. So most Europeans, especially in England and everything, have Danish roots to them. In fact, I know red hair comes from two sources, the Danes and or you know vikings all the nord nordic people and uh indians uh from india those are the two roots of red hair um uh -huh. and it's kind of funny yes. because karen's daughter rihanna she's got red hair but she has both roots because karen's roots are europe and mostly england but then her father's from india so it's hard to say where she gets her red hair from but right. um but i think blue eyes might be similar Somebody's asking because they're wondering about the blue. And people were making points that even though they didn't have words for them, the Egyptians, for instance, still used blue and purple. They were sure. royal colors. That's what I'm saying. I mean, like, yeah, the, I'm not saying that we couldn't see these things before we had names for them. Obviously, that's, you know, not what mm -hmm. I'm saying. Uh, but we didn't speak about them as clearly until we had words for them, I guess, you know, in a fine tuned kind of way grand you know there's still other languages out there that still don't have words for these things or these colors or just other things in general that we in english do um i just found it fascinating i'm trying to think of the name of the book let me i, I put it in my notes do, 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 so he says first wise came from the anunnaki but i mean the anunnaki didn't exist there were another mythology of the sumerians so uh <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure how we would know that from DNA or something, but she could be saying a joke or not. I don't know. Um, so really interesting. So I love this book and I love the, the history of it. And it's really weird. What I love about books like this is that, you know, it had such an effect on our society and we don't even know that, you know, that uh, Greek and Roman mythology, I mean, is really a bedrock if we look at our own, Capitol buildings or anywhere you go, if you're in the city, um, references in popular culture and it all literature kinds as of we know it. Yeah. Yeah. Literature as we know it's plays. I mean, uh, novels, prose, philosophy, the Greeks, you know, they, they did it all the Romans perfected it. Um, and another thing about a lot of these, you know, mythology, our system of I, government. Yeah, systems of government. Uh, Bullfinch's mythology, a lot, he get, gets a lot of it from uh, Virgil and Ovid. So reading those classical texts. And that's where a lot of the mythologies come from. And so every, a lot of stuff borrowing from Bullfinch's to this day are like rewrites of classical stuff. And they're getting stuff. It's like the telephone game. If this was more of a religion, I think it would be more tied down. Greek mythology but again, I, I, you get to this dreamy – I can't stress this enough how dreamy Greek mythology is where it's just like jumps from one thing to another. Like now it happened some years before the King Minos' son, Androgynous of Crete visited Athens. There won all the competitions of the athletic games, running, jumping, boxing, wrestling, and throwing. Argyne's jealous nephews accused him of a plot to seize the throne and murdered him. When Minos complained, so it's like jumps from one thing to another, like a dream yeah. does. It really mm. is like so fluid, like that. It's amazing, and so I feel like if there was more of a modern religious wrap around us, we would tie it down because you know, in the Western world, when you, from place to place, these are town or village to village, the stories change a little to suit that village or suit a certain political agenda from that village or from that time, and so they weren't as tied down as the Bible as we know it is. But there was also a time when the Bible was also really loosey goosey too, uh, and, and granted, to the, it still is. Uh, it's the four apostles, if you read those, they, there's still conflicting stuff going on in there. But for the most part, it's more tied down than Greek mythology. So it's interesting to see how it really is like the stream of con non-linear stream of consciousness weave throughout. And I think no one does it better or lays it out better than Robert Graves. He's a poet, or was a poet. So I mean, like, there's that. Um, but I don't think he does it. 
this is what I this book is from my childhood actually. Uh, I don't think he does as, as good a job as Bull Finch does, but he is a classicist nonetheless, and uh, very well read and well and a wonderful writer. But not my favorite when it comes to Rodrigo makes a point that the the hero's uh, journey, the idea of the hero's journey, uh, comes from mythology. And for those who aren't aware of that, uh, at which he says, you know, so we wouldn't have Star Wars if it wasn't for that. Which is a, a point that yeah, Joseph Campbell is a guy who came up with this, and Joseph Campbell is amazing. Power um, of myth. I highly, highly recommend. Yeah, the power of myth where he talks about what's great. I love about Joseph Campbell is, and the idea of the hero's journey is that, uh, you know, essentially that you have, a uh, you know, an underdog, uh, it's kind of a, a coming of age. Everything's kind of a coming of age story where even, and you can apply it to your own life and how our, all of our lives are a hero's journey where we kind of, you know, are seeking to advance ourselves uh, and and interacting with uh, um, more powerful and potentially uh, um, supernatural archetypes to get to our journey. And we have these battles of good and evil within and without, you know, these battles are going on inside of us uh, as well as outside of us. Just how everything represents itself um, but it, yeah, really good stuff. I would really highly recommend people look at Joseph Campbell's stuff. And I know that um, George Lucas is a huge Joseph Campbell fan. And he's admitted that, you know, when he did Star Wars, he he really modeled it off of Joseph Campbell's work. So that's a great wor uh, point for Rodrigo. He says, geeks for the Greeks, which is a good point for those of us who are sci-fi geeks, which is probably a lot of us uh, that we get so excited about that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's, that's like a frat or something. Um, nerd. Uh, the lambda, lambda, lambda. Um, shit. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, Star Wars, definitely Greek mythology, but you also get the Revolutionary War, too, element there. I think there's a, something very American about Star Wars with the rebels versus the Empire. Mm -hmm. you, you'll see that in it as well. Um, but anyways, so while reading Bullfinches, I'd like to uh, – Teach Yourself Mythology is a great book to accompany this, this when you're sitting down with this. It really breaks everything down when it comes to diff different mythologies. It's a lot like uh, Power of Myth. In fact, I wouldn't doubt it if that's something they source. But a uh, great little pocket book for reading this. And then, of course, the Oxford Classical Dictionary. Now, in theory, you don't really need any of these things because it's all in bullfinches. But I thought it... Again, it's kind of dated, and he does make some mistakes. So if if you're going to you know lay something to memory, you might as well lay it down true by seeing where the mistakes are. Luckily, the uh, the editor for this version of it does make notations here and there, like eh, no, that didn't really happen, or uh, that's not true. But for for all of that. He does a wonderful job. Bullfinch does a really really great job, and I think anyone interested in getting up. To, up, up to date, I wouldn't say up to date, but just getting up on their uh, classical literature, or just classical education, this is a great, great book for that and really a sweet deal. I would call it a text. Um, for like 25 bucks, a handsome book, and it's all in there. And I'm, again, super excited to be able to tear this thing apart, really, now that I don't have anything worrisome on my mind. <laughs> okay, I uh, decided to come up with a little game here. Oh, I'm going to do a couple more things. Phoenix shaving. What's that? And you'll love this, Doug, what I'm doing right here. Uh oh, another game. I was on a podcast earlier today being interviewed, and they did a surprise trivia. No, this is – I just posted a bunch of hashtags. Because I'm that – we've all been coming up together. Uh, Cartola has been our hashtag king. Um, so I <laughs> – I did one that'll make Stacy mad, which is fun. But the first person, I will do it on Twitter and for Doug, because he's an Instagram guy, which is good. I need to get on Instagram. The first to tweet and or Instagram with all of these hashtags <laughs> wins a prize. I'm not sure. <laughs> 
I'll uh, I'll ask you. I've got a bunch of T-shirts. That I get you know because this stuff that I talk to you guys about. These guys send me. I've got some T-shirts and other stuff. If uh, the first people to Instagram and or tweet with those hashtags, we will. Uh, I'll get. I'll send you a T-shirt. Um, I put in there Shakespeare, conspiracy, Star Wars, geeks for Greeks, and Nunakai are not real. That's that's one that Stacy's gonna love. Phoenix shaving, Open Minds TV are the hashtags. But nice. I do want to talk about the Anunnaki because what's interesting, though, to me, um, I, it's one of the things that I think uh, is, is interesting about UFOs and, and being involved with that that field. I used to find it more interesting now. I And then I go back from finding it interesting to scary, especially with recent events. Sometimes it's kind of scary is these belief systems that people can build. So, for instance, yes, Greek I'm mythology. Greek mythology so yes. has a lot of roots in the Sumerian. Um, you know, all of us, because the Sumerians were the oldest uh, civilization we, we know of that recorded history oh, about 3,000 years ago. Um, the Bible stories all come from this. And there are a lot of people, it doesn't happen so much with Greek mythology. Someone even mentioned, it's kind of interesting, you even talked about it, that Greek mythology is no longer really a religion, that there's a lot of people um, act on and, and, and actively, you know, participate in. But there are so many, like, uh, belief systems that get built up, like, around the Anunnaki or some of these other older mythologies it's just interesting how when these less uh, popular mythologies can pop up and influence, you know, people's belief systems in the modern age. Yeah. Yeah. I was actually, you know, while this was all going on in the last couple of weeks, November onward, I'm reading and studying all this mythology. And again, great book, uh, Teach Yourself Mythology. But I mean, it's how myths, myths grow and it's stages of development. You get animism, fetishism totemism, uh, so on and so forth. And I'm reading this while people are talking about this thing called QAnon. Mm. And I'm, so I started looking at that and it runs parallel with how myths develop. So I was like, I'm just swimming in all this mythology speak at that particular moment and just gaining uh, some serious insight on, on mythology and including modern mythology and watching one grow. I mean, as bad as that thing is, we're very lucky to be able to sit back and watch it on a global scale develop in front of our eyes over the last couple of years. Uh, you don't mm -hmm. often get that. It, it's not often called out like that. And I don't think anyone's called it a myth yet, but I mean, but I'm looking at it as a new modern mythology. Um, yeah, which, you're right. And I think you're exactly right. And a lot of these things, especially in, you know, the field of UFOs and aliens, Jacques Vallée made a point um, in the seventies when he talked to the UN uh, he's a well-known UFO re researcher, scientist, venture capitalist, all of this. We really? uh, worked with Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who helped the uh, government investigate UFOs back in the 60s and the 50s and all that. But he said the, the problem with not sharing information about certain topics is that the public then will just fill the gap with make-believe. And you're going to then have a problem with a lot of m misinformation out there. And it's going to generate a lot of misinformation. And he's exactly correct. And um, in I, I talk about this in my lecture about religions, how religions react to the ideas of extraterrestrials and how this idea has also spawned new religions. And in that sense, he's exactly correct. Now, back in the day, he actually had um, some of the Heaven's Gates people, those two main characters, visit him um before the female part of that couple killed her or died she didn't kill herself i think she died um it's just the rest of them that killed themselves right um so i mean he saw this firsthand and saw this happen which is really uh somebody you know i think this is really funny um rodrigo says i predict in the near future there will be a geek mythology and there kind of already is he's exactly oh, right <laughs> the next <laughs> comment is. was a lot of Yoda sayings come out of the Baga Bavaga Gita, roughly. But I think it's um, Diana Pasolka's book. She's an author, uh, a professor of religious studies. 
And she wrote a book recently kind of on UFOs and, and UFO belief and stuff. And what's interesting is I think she was going to approach it more academically, but really the book turned into how she began to believe some of this stuff. But she talks about the growing and it's kind of hidden Star Wars culture where there is this Jedi religious belief and people who really believe that they are Jedis and, and they follow that. Um, which is really interesting. I always think of in the future, you know, when uh, they excavate our civilization and they find like all these Yodas around, good point with Yoda, you know, are they going to believe he was a God of ours or something? And the funny thing is, is even though that would kind of be wrong in a way, it's also not because like, for instance, me, and I think a lot of us, maybe you or a lot of us, especially us geeks that, uh, of this age, we learned a lot about philosophy and we learned a lot of philosophical ideas through Yoda and through, you know, these, these outlets, uh, which have their roots in much older mythologies. But um, yeah, it's all, I think it's all really fascinating. It is. And, and, you know, to me, I've always described uh, Greek myths as ancient comic books because that comic books just are an extension mm. of that tradition. Uh, and they borrow a lot from it too. I mean, hell, look at Thor. I mean, it's just a continuation of an ongoing uh, story. So, I mean, uh, a modern continuation. But yeah, oh yeah, geek, geek speak and geek culture and geek myth is already, we're in the thick of it. Um, so much so it's almost disgusting. It's like, I, I it turns me into a hipster. Like, oh, really? My mom's <laughs> hip with this now. Like, she's quoting Yoda and like that. It, it, ta it takes a little bit of the edge off of it. Uh, like, yeah, I'm that guy. Uh, but yeah, no, we're definitely here. But yeah, back to what Jacques was saying. Yeah, I oh, mean, and that's yeah. just like a micro. I mean, humans and our so the way our brains operate, we want to fill in the gaps. So when we're operating as a herd or as a group, it's even it's intensified and magnified the the want to put those pieces together that aren't there and to find connections that may be there but aren't really there. Is if you know what I mean. There's you can pretty much connect anything to some level and make that make sense, or just to find resolution or resolve. So you can sleep easier at night. Um, so I see, I, I see us forcing these pieces together all the time in culture, as it is. And then back to your finding Yoda in the future. I often think of that too. Like, or when they, when they're finding literature, like uh, some you know magazine talking about star Hollywood stars, stars. Like, oh, they were star worshippers back then. You know, just totally getting right, it wrong. Yeah. Which makes me wonder how often do we get it wrong? And that's and when you look at ancient aliens, it's like they get it wrong. They have to get it around wrong a lot because they're using a modern filter to view the past with. And, uh, you know, I often, you know, the stuff they're talking about, like in a lot of cave art and whatnot, uh, not the stuff, the shamanic stuff, but some of the weird like drawings and whatnot. We had children back in the day too. If you didn't have a babysitter, you gave them a piece of charcoal and said, hit the rocks with it. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's, I don't think that's much of a stretch when you, when you're trying to decode a spiral. You know, it's like that could have been easily a child or whatever. You're thinking too hard into it. I mean, yeah. we Google, we doodle all day. People are like, well, look at this mysterious symbol. Okay, look at this. I'm doodling here and I've got this half star type of symbol. You know, uh, that's and the type of thing. Like if Karen saw that, you know, yeah. if that was like a business symbol, but we saw yeah. it in ancient writing, she'd right. be like, oh, that's got to mean something. We've gotten in there. We were at the in New York at the museum looking at the Egyptian stuff. And she's like, look, there's an ellipse that had to be like a, them seeing a UFO. And I'm like, no, it's a common. There's yeah. many things that are elliptical, lens shaped. Uh, yeah. No, it's not necessarily. And, and also, you know, standardized vision. I mean, we have standardized vision right nowadays. So we often forget back then they didn't. Everyone saw the world differently. So if you're painting a painting and you have four stars instead of two stars or what, you might have just saw four stars because your eyes were so blurry. So we, we, there's so much so much to take into consideration yeah. before you make a call on what something is when you're looking back at something. Because more often yeah. than not, you're looking at it wrong. You're just looking at it wrong. You know, people are making some good points, too, in the chat. They're talking about different people in the UFO field, and I won't name names, but oh, people will. that are <laughs> – um, have these really fringe beliefs about things, about the world, uh, about, you know, essentially conspiracy theories and mythologies and how they really are creating their own cult followings, which I think is true. And they're also because they're building their own mythologies. And, you know, there's, there's a difference 
the confidence thing is a big deal. When someone has a lot of confidence in what they're saying, um, then they're they they're more influential, um, and so that works in sales. But that's why they call con men con men because they are confidence men. They're um, exuberating confidence. But a con person is usually doing it falsely. They're trying to convince you of something that isn't true. Um, whereas some cult leaders or whatever, charisma, Mary says, they're doing it because they believe what they're saying. And certainly in this field, that's what's interesting is people begin to believe their own mythology and push that. And they believe it so strongly. Um, you know, one uh, um, female researcher in particular, they're referring to is so adamant about her beliefs that she's able to commit you know convince so many people and now she's going around with her own kind of almost like little religion um convincing people whereas there are some people who are also well known who we um uh, people in the chat feel and i agree are complete frauds they're con men um who are also out there in this field and especially with this field it's very ripe where you can easily create your own mythology and have a big following. Um, so for instance, and I know Stacy would disagree with me and I'm not sure if she's watching anymore. She might be at work. So she what comes in and out. Um, but you know, this is another one getting back to, and I, I know you'd have some input on this is um, the, the Sumerian stuff. Uh, there was one person who translated the, many of those Sumerian tablets in a specific way, feeling that he could see a definite narrative and he sold that in books and it became, a, you know, its own religion. So many people believe it. It turns out that he, uh, he was wrong. I mean, he was not translating accurately and scholars will now know that, but still there's a lot of people that hold on to this belief system he built around that. Um, that's what, you know, of course I'm a man of science. I stick to science because I think recent, our recent history demonstrates that these sort of things can be really dangerous. Um, and that we should try to be really careful, um, with our belief systems, especially, you know, if it doesn't call for hurting anybody, that's great. Uh, I make the argument that the, uh, uh, Arthurian society, for instance, it's one of these new religions created by, uh, by alien belief. Um, but it's very positive They They just talk about, you know, peace and love, um, how they accept all religious beliefs. And they think that all religions are really just a different manifestation of the same thing. So it's very positive and loving. I don't see any danger there. What is In fact, religion? Uh, the Arthurians. I, in fact, uh, I got an email recently um, from one of their members who heard my talk on religion and was like, hey, if you want to know more, we'll I don't really want to know more. Thank you. But uh, I use it as an example. Just that it's a positive, whereas it's even more positive and uh, inviting than our major religions out there, which, you know, if you don't believe in them, they believe you're going to hell or going somewhere bad. Um and of course, then there's the far end of things where there's heaven's gate, where it's really dangerous, where of course, you know, that caused people to hurt themselves. So um, uh, it's interesting, but at the same time, especially right now, you know, people need to be discerning and be careful. And, you know, um, it's, it does scare me, especially when people demonize others and many of the belief systems. And this is a part that becomes scary in the UFO world or, uh, is, uh, is frightening because they, they demonize people who don't deserve it. Um, I think we've talked about this before, which is really funny. The evil cabal that is the Smithsonian. Oh, which I yeah. think it's just so ridiculous. It's, and it's one of those things that are frustrating. It's like NASA. I love the Smithsonian. These are scientists. These are archeologists. These are people uncovering information on a regular basis and sharing it with the public so we can all learn and grow and learn about our past. Do they get things wrong sometimes? Totally. Uh, nobody's perfect, but 
<laughs> and yeah, that's how science works. It evolves as we learn more and more and more. But to demonize these people and to think that they're hiding something from us or even intentionally doing it to hurt us or, yeah. or NASA's doing the same thing. I mean, you can easily go to these places, meet the researchers, meet astronauts, meet scientists at NASA, meet Smithsonian researchers. You can do tours with them and learn nuance, you know, minutia, the minutia about how and why, what they're doing on a daily basis. Yeah. And find out that they're just people trying to discover this or that. And you'll find out yeah. that, you know, the leading theory, maybe you don't agree with the leading theory. Well, you know what? You're probably going to find there are a host of researchers out there who also don't agree with the leading theory. And they have evidence to show why they believe what they believe. So, I mean, um, it, it, the demonization, especially the, the demonization, the, uh, the idea of hurting people, these are the negative aspects of these false belief systems that we really need to be careful with. Um, and it really frightens me. And uh, even right now, and maybe because of the past, and this is part of the effect that this field has had, um, I want even less to deal with some of all of that belief stuff. And people say, I don't believe I know. No, you don't know. You can't yeah. prove it. You're believing. And if you're, it's okay to believe when I yeah. say, uh, UFOs are a genuine mystery. I believe that. Can I prove it? I think I can right now. And, and that's the beauty is that the mainstream, we've been able to demonstrate that. But it's okay if I call it a belief. Um, yeah. I'm not afraid of that because it is a belief. Unless I can prove it, it's a belief. And it's okay if we have beliefs. Yeah, but as long as they're not hurting anybody, but by all means have them. But I mean, I think uh, looking at forums when, when comparing religions to uh, just all the different factions that break off of one forum when someone disagrees with another person and then get, you have all these different forums on the same topic now only because of these um, um, schisms that happened in the same way that they happen in religion. And what's, what's the, the correlation is just the humans are involved. <laughs> we can't get along with each other when it comes to stuff. And when it comes to the Smithsonian <laughs> being the bad guy, yeah, it was the original bad guy before the Nazis were the, the were the bad guys in these tales. It was the Smithsonian. So I love how you see the same tropes come again and again and again in that liter in that type of literature and that type of uh, uh, mm. pop culture mentions. Uh, it's What's hysterical. funny that I have to feel like this, and I do that when I wear my NASA hat, which I do on purpose. In a way, it's a little bit defiant towards the UFO crowd because it's like I I want them to know. I have nothing to do with these ridiculous ideas and unsubstantiated claims that so many make uh, about the, the the nefarious nature of NASA, especially when you know I get to meet these people and interview them on a fairly regular basis, or or I go to a facility and get to you know know people, which anybody can do. And I mean, they're just wonderful. They're they're the most exciting people in the world they're looking into the stuff that we're into they're looking into space and the potential of uh, alien life and i mean and they're they're some of the most impressive and exciting people in the world what they're doing so um i think we we have to make sure we're plugging ourselves into society regardless of our belief systems you know that we're we're going and you don't have to be outside looking in you can get in and you're actually going to have more of an influence when you're in who has been most influential when it comes to ufo stuff chris mellon and louise elizondo lately why because they're insiders they've been working in the intelligence community for decades they were able to make changes from the inside so i mean um i think we we're more productive when we embrace and work with others as opposed to demonizing on top of it more happens yep no, it's true. I mean, that is, as a society, we need to work together. If you want to be part of the society, we need to work together. If you don't, then then talk to Elon Musk about getting off, going off planet. With <laughs> yeah, yeah. Support it. I agree with you a hundred percent. That should be the first Elon Musk, which is kind of <laughs> the naughty bus. Just take. I'm them. trying to stop myself. Yeah, <laughs> not from saying something bad. It's just yeah. I get so excited right now because of space and the possibilities and all of the nuance around it that we're so not ready for 
um, that it's, it's really just exciting because space right now is totally the wild west and we're headed there quickly yeah. and people are just figuring it out on the fly. And I've been paying a lot of attention to, um, policy stuff. It's certainly, um, my buddy from Politico, Brian Bender rubbing off on me, but space policy is an area it's not being looked at too much, but it's really exciting because right now we're figuring out the rules and regulations and how do we actually live on the moon because we're planning to do that soon. How do we live on Mars? And I, I think people don't realize these things are pose a much bigger problem than people like Elon Musk uh, uh, are alluding to. I mean, he's got no plan for living on Mars, how do we actually have people stay on Mars for a period of time? They're still figuring out, and we don't know. Well, this is all stuff we're figuring out, even though we're so close to potentially being there. It's, it, I think it's a really exciting time regarding space, and totally off topic, but uh, I just no, can't help it when we talk about space stuff. It's part of it. What fascinates me is the fact that we can do stuff like that, but at the same time, we still don't know the physics behind riding a bicycle. Hmm. How bicycles work. We don't know how bicycles work. We'll leave that or not. We just not. figured out how bees fly. I, well, at least well, there's some theories out, out right now. We were still like confused with, with how insects fly. Uh, but bikes too. Yeah. Hummingbirds too. Hummingbirds, butterflies. Um, Lightning. But yeah. But a bicycle. You would think the bike by now. We would be able to tell you how that works. And we can't. That's bizarre to me. Yet we're putting people on the moon, or we've put people on the moon, um, or I, I, like that's scary. <laughs> we're so advanced, but we're also so not advanced. It blows my I mind. That is the tie-in, and that's what I've been trying to think of. Is what led me tied to this kind of um, what inspired me, regardless of talking about space and NASA. What inspired me to go on this tangent? That's the tie-in. What you're saying right there, which is what I've kind of lost, is that while we become technologically advanced, we're still very similar to those ancient Greeks or ancient Romans yeah. and their so mythological belief systems and their yeah. mythological worldviews. Um, the beauty of America, America, when it comes to philosophy, we were the origin of... Um, pragmatism pragmatism comes from the united states this is the beauty of america is, is that we stuck and we believed in science and we made it work we figured yeah. out how to do uh, assembly lines we figured out which helped us you know driven mostly by world war ii to you know world war ii drove a lot of that but it's because we applied logic and science and pragmatism that we were able to become the world power that we are and I, I don't think and some people have said in, and we need to educate the public on on critical thinking, but also ph philosophy. I think that, well, you know, yes, uh, yes. Phil the philosophical reasons why we do what we do, what makes us American and uh, especially right now, you know, what is it? It is as pragmatism and, and things like that. And it's also inclusivity okay. and equality and equity and all of these other things that make us so strong. You know, we have to remember the tangibles. Um, and I think that's really something important that we've lost along the way. And when we lose that, these philosophical ideas, we're kind of flailing in the wind. And I think then people are more susceptible to adopting these systematic, these worldviews where everything's put together for you. Here's your yeah. philosophy on on how you view the world. Um, Just plug right in. Yeah, but you plug right in. And th that's what's scary is the part that sometimes you're plugging into this group of society is really evil and they're trying to take you down and hurt you. Yeah. Uh, when, and when that's completely not true, especially when these communities are people who are doing the opposite. They're trying yeah. to save you. They're trying to help you. Um, yeah. Those are the but dangerous parts. It's old. Um, you know, it's, it, we're, we're still running on an old system here. We need an upgrade is what it all comes down to. Uh, and I feel like we've been plugged into these old obsolete um, ideologies for such a long time. They, they've actually held us back from mental, mentally evolving, you know, which I, I don't think we're where we could be because of being held back by a lot of these old uh, programs that we're still running that need to be tossed out. That's geek talk. <laughs>
So Dirk says, I'm trying to defect to Bonobo Society. That's hilarious because I'm a monkey fan. I'm a big animal fan. That's why I'm a vegetarian. And I, I go to the zoo a lot, um, especially the San Diego Zoo, which has been closed. It's opening up in the next couple of weeks. Thank goodness. Thanks to science. Thanks to the vaccine. The Take the vaccine, the people. Take I don't the go to the vaccine. <laughs> What's that? This is the difference between vegans and vegetarians. As a vegan, I don't go to the zoo. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. And I do. I know uh, that's a debate in our community, <laughs> certainly. Um, but that's why I love that Bonobo Society. That's hilarious, Dirk. I feel like that joke was almost tailor made for me. Thank you. Dirk it. is one of my heroes of the day. Dirk is always our hero. Uh, Strafe is making a point. Going to Mars or the moon is them. It's never you or us. We don't qualify. It's an elite sport. Awesome. Not, that. I, I would disagree. But he has a point in a way. I would disagree in that, you know, especially our current moon um, and Mars missions are NASA missions. And those are people who represent our country or our society. And we do all go along because we do all um, reap the benefits. In other words, the science that is discovered is shared publicly and we all gain from it. When Elon goes by himself, that's something different because he's a private corporation. And if he's the first to go, which he probably will be, he makes the call. He does whatever he wants, how he wants. And to Strafe's point, this is one thing that uh, is interesting when we're moving on to society um, or we're getting more advanced is, you know, eventually he's right. Eventually, just like any type of travel, it's going to be really expensive if you want to go to the moon or the Mars. So it's only going to be reserved for the rich. What's even scarier, some other technologies like DNA manipulation also are going to be very expensive. I mean, we are potentially, if we're not careful, and I guess this is kind of, the roots, this is, gets all back to the same thing. Our philosophical uh, perspectives on the world is that, you know, our, our current kind of capitalist economy driven perspective is really taking us towards this even more extreme separation between the elites and the rest of the population. Kind of like there's a movie, that movie with Matt Damon. Um yeah. That was kind of into this where, you know, the elites are going to be able to afford to uh, manipulate the, their children's DNA where they don't have diseases. Uh, they can even make them look better, have better metabolisms, um, okay. customized colors of their eyes and everything, you know, um, whereas that kind of technology won't be accessible. And they'll be able to go to travel in space, maybe go to Mars. Gattaca, someone says, kind of like Gattaca. Yeah, that was one of them. Gattaca. That's uh, what's so. Uh, I think you know the point is that we're at a crossing point where these technologies are coming so extraordinary, but the way we're going is that they're only going to be accessible to the few who can afford it. Which I think, yeah, if we don't get that under control, um. We're going to be looking at an Elysium. That's the movie I was thinking of, Christian. Thank you. But a uh, Elysium or Gattaca type of future. We're seriously headed very, we're headed that way. And in both communities, um, when it comes to DNA manipulation, and these are just a couple technologies, uh, and space um, tourism, there are people who are very concerned about these issues. Um, but those, unfortunately, are not what people are listening to people. It's kind of like what uh, Dr. Elliot was that his name on Jurassic park. We uh, were so concerned if we could do it, we didn't stop to think if we should do it. Yeah. And the, the people who are thinking about should we, or how do we are definitely the uh, voices that are less listened to than the people who are saying, let's do it. Cause we can do it. Right. Right. I don't think anybody would. I'm a big fan of Elon Musk and what he's done but I'm not a big fan of how his brain works uh, when it comes to his ideas about society and everything. So I'm not sure he's going to be the best to represent how these things should be done. But the way our system works is he has full control to figure it, to do it however he wants. 
Yeah. If he created a base on the moon right now, he can create the laws. I mean, we really, he can literally enforce any rules in any way that he wants. Um, we just don't have a structure to, to do anything else right now. Cause we dropped the ball. We kind of dropped the ball. Yeah. Um, here's, well, I guess let's see people talking about taxes, stuff like that. Blue, blue, blue. I will, be you belong as a zoo, the San Diego zoo. Yes. Gas masks. I do belong. I'm a member to the San Diego zoo. Love it. Um, Diego zoo. I think that was, a uh, we should wrap it up anyway. We need to go Star Trek. Rodrigo, I believe I agree with you 100%. I think that's why I like, especially I watched uh, Next Generation the other day. I mean, I was, I literally, when I was younger, I, I wanted to, I was always been into the news and politics and stuff. Um, but I, I so wanted to walk through the TV to be a part of that society that's just so much more advanced than ours and so much more enlightened. Hopefully, one day we'll get there. Um, gas mass says if we don't do it, China will, which is really what's driving, uh, a lot of our space policy right now is what's China going to do. Same, same deal as a space race. And yeah. honestly, that's the type of competition we need. I hate to say it, but if that's, what's going to motivate us. Yeah, you're right. You know, and I, I wrote about this when it happened. Why are, why did Trump say we're going to the moon? Um, it was because of China and Russia said they were going to go. And oh, so we yeah. had to beat him. It was a new space race. And now a lot of yeah. people are saying, well, what's Biden going to do? Because he hasn't talked about our moon project. A lot of people in the space industry are saying, let's keep going there. We need to go there. It's a smarter move to do the moon first and then Mars and have a strong um, support system on the moon that can support our further deep space pro program. Humans on people the moon. Like, that, though. But I was really, going to uh -huh, go ahead destroy the moon too though like there's part of me that's glad we never did do anything up there because if we just we that set, what do you mean oh we're totally going to destroy it oh i know and, and then that comes off every i mean like without the moon what do we have um well nobody so, lives there right now so i don't know what sort of negative effects that we could have on our planet but certainly we'll have negative effects on the natural state of the moon as we begin it, to be a total uh, tear away mine Build, it'll, be a building. Call, it'll be a revolutionary war where they want to break away from Earth and have their own thing going on. Which is possible. In fact, and there are theories about this and what to do. And a lot of people are saying they should be sovereign. They should, from the get-go, we should have a sovereign, separate system of um, of governorship because a, a, they bring in ideas like the with the America and the, the English – You've got to make snap decisions. When you have an emergency, you can't wait for Earth to come back and tell you what to do. You've got to make your decisions now. And the idea that we're not going to understand the needs of moon, um, people living on the moon, as well as they are going to understand those. Um, so it's kind of interesting. Do I believe the Earth's hollow? No, I, I don't believe that the Earth is hollow. Um, but yeah, so... the but. I was getting to that. We went to the moon. Trump announced the moon system because of China and Russia. And it was, you know, the prevailing, I think, um, sentiment of people in the space program, other than there's big debates. A lot of people say we should just go straight to Mars and not waste the time and the money. Um, but I think most people feel that we should go to the moon first. But the political situation is much different now. I mean, because of Elon Musk uh, taking over uh, a SpaceX taking over our essentially our space transport mm -hmm. programs. Yeah. It's really diminished Russia's influence. And now, especially with kind of the problematic relationships we've had, we deal, we don't work with Russia as much, but Russia isn't really a threat to get to the moon, but China certainly is. China's, you know, gotten, they've gotten to the dark side of the moon. We don't have a rover on the dark side. They do. Um, they're really starting to move up. So China's still a, comp a competition. And you're right. The competition probably is healthy. I mean, and looking at SpaceX, look what it did to the space industry. Talking about having a kick in the pants to the space industry. The SLS, 
wanted to be first to uh, the Boeing. And they wanted to be the first to get humans to the ISS. Um, right. They're still not capable of doing that. I mean, they they were neck and neck with uh, SpaceX for a period of time, uh, much more expensive. And then SpaceX just pulled ahead and they kept saying, oh, yeah, we're still going to beat them. They didn't. They're still not there. So, I mean, SpaceX is just so far ahead of pretty much. I think Bezos is more further ahead than um, Boeing. Um, he's now had his several tests where his rocket goes up and comes right back and lands. So funny. So, new rip uh, Kids dream is, is, is rockets. <laughs> but I think that's what's really fun about all of this is applying this to the future. It's kind of like if you haven't seen really um, Scott has a show called Children Raised by Wolves. It's called Raised by Wolves on HBO and um, HBO Max. And it's interesting in that one of the societies, uh, the humans are have a religious faction and an um, atheist faction where the religious factions killing the atheists. And that's kind of what it's about is the atheists have programmed these robots to kind of preserve the last bastion of a, an atheist society. Um, but it comes back to those philosophical ideas um, applied to the future. Um, this is a sun worshiping religion, um, yeah. but that, you know, our advancements in technology uh, and where we're heading in the future may feel like advancements in society, but they're not completely the technology and, and philosophical um, worldview issues are totally separate. Um, but yeah. if we don't really pay attention to the one side, you know, the, the technology can be used for bad, which is just more often than not around. Yeah. Like and that's we're at, destroying our planet. The geeks one in uh, geek mythology is a real thing is the fact that these rich guys, the richest people on the planet right now are major geeks. <laughs> yeah. All of them. <laughs> yeah. We should wrap it up. I'll just answer this question. Uh, Mars radiation will kill everybody in a couple months. Not necessarily. There are things you can do, but you have to live underground um, and you do have to have radiation shielding, but that's something that's doable. You can live underground. We do have methods to uh, shield ourselves from radiation. So that's doable. The gravity really becomes a bigger part. And not only that, working outside in Mars, you can't do it very much because of the radiation. That's a good point. And that's a huge problem that they're still working on and they haven't figured out. Um, why do we still have rockets to go to space? That's the only type of propulsion that we understand. That's the only type of propulsion we can build to do things like go to space, to build enough power to exit uh, the Earth's gravity, to pull away from the Earth's gravity. I know people like to think that there's anti-gravity or these other things, but there's absolutely no proof of any of that. Um, I argue that we would see it because uh, we do see everything. Uh, we're able to see everything in our orbit. So um, that's why. And what it's crazy and it's wild to think about, but it's true. Mars, Aries, Greek mythology. We just tied the whole room together, folks. One more look at Bullfinch's mythology. Live it, love it, read it. I'm telling you it's a great read. It's going to catch you up with all a lot of the Western mythologies out there. Um, and again, this is a leather-bound version of it, which I thought was really high quality. Canterbury Classics is what this is called. And, uh, you know, it's interesting how I brought up the similarity between Barnes and Noble's leather bound books. The address for this is Barnes Canyon Road. More synchronicity, folks. It doesn't stop here. Bullfinch's Mythology. Check it out. Until next time, this is Douglas Smythe from PhoenixShaving.com signing off with his co host, Alejandro Rojas. <laughs> Thank you for joining <laughs> us. <laughs> and adios. Ciao.